Welcome to our podcast today, Christ Church's podcast on leadership in the Wesleyan faith and tradition. Today we're looking at a text from Solomon's uh, expression of wisdom in Ecclesiastes, dealing primarily with chapter 10, even though the one-year Bible reading is 9, 10, and 11. And uh, we've been in this time when uh, Solomon says that all of life is meaningless, uh, has meaninglessness to it. It's, it's not of meaning and purpose, and yet he does instruct us, uh, if you're going to live, then you might as well have some principles to live by. Well, today I entitled this section, this leadership lesson, Pitfalls and Ironies of Leadership. So let's go right to the text itself. Um, As dead flies cause even a bottle of perfume to stink, so a little foolishness spoils great wisdom and honor. A wise person chooses, chooses the right road. A fool takes the wrong one. You can identify fools just by the way they walk down the street. If your boss is angry at you, don't quit. A quiet spirit can overcome even great mistakes. There's another evil I've seen under the sun. Kings and rulers make a grave mistake when they give great authority to foolish people and low positions to people of proven worth. I've even seen servants riding horseback like princes and princes walking like servants. When you dig a well, you might fall in. When you demolish an old well, you could be bitten by a snake. When you work in a quarry, stones might fall and crush you. When you chop wood, there's danger with each stroke of your axe. Using a dull axe requires great strength, so sharpen the blade. That's the value of wisdom. It helps you succeed. If a snake bites you before you charm it, what's the use of being a snake charmer? Wise words bring approval, but fools are destroyed by their own words. Fools base their thoughts on foolish assumptions, so their conclusions will be wicked madness. They chatter on and on. No one really knows what's going to happen. No one can predict the future. Fools are so exhausted by little work that they can't even find their way home. What sorrow for the land ruled by a servant, the land whose leaders feast in the morning. Happy is the land whose king is a noble leader and whose leaders feast at the proper time to gain strength for their work, not to get drunk. Laziness leads to a snagging roof. Idleness leads to a leaky house. Party gives laughter, wine gives happiness, and money gives everything. Never make light of the king, even in your thoughts. Don't make fun of the powerful, even in your own bedroom. For a little bird might deliver your message and tell them what you said. Isaiah 40 and 1 Peter says, The grass will one day wither, and flowers one day they are going to fade away. But this word of the living God, it will stand forever. Thanks be to God. So there's a couple principles that I think Solomon wants us to glean from this, at least as I've read and reread and tried to ponder these principles for myself. The first one I want to say is pretty obvious, but it still needs to be said. Choose, choose the right path early and don't lead alone. Choose the right path early and don't lead alone. Now, the lead alone part comes from the previous four chapters, uh, he talks about the importance of two people being together. Two people give each other strength. If one of them falls down, the other can help pick them up. And then, of course, he even goes into the, the three strands that are, when they're tied together, they make a stronger rope. But choose the right path early. John Maxwell says it this way. He says, make Wise choices, the most successful people he's ever known. Most successful people he's ever known. And it's in business or it's in nonprofit leadership, maybe in sports or it may be in the local church. The most successful people he's ever known made wise choices early on and then they spent the rest of their lives managing those choices. Now, 
you say, well, gosh, how can I make wise choices when I'm 19, 20, 22, 25, 27, 30? Well, you get around wise people. That's how you can do it. You get around wise people and you ask a lot of questions. One of the things that John did early on as a young pastor, he had a wise father. His father was a leader within their denomination. But what John did is he spent time and he took time. Now, this is back in the days before cell phones, text, email, etc. So he had to depend on snail mail and phone calls. So he wrote ahead of time 10 of the largest churches um, and well-known churches and healthy churches in America. And, uh, and he called them. He told them he'd be calling them. And he said, I'd like to give you, now this was back in the late 60s, um, early 70s. I believe it was somewhere around 68, 69. And he said, I want to give you $100 for an hour of your time. Now, back in the late 60s, folks, that was, that was a chunk of change. It'd probably be close to four or 500 today. But I'm going to give you $100 for an hour of your time. And uh, my family are going to be in your area within a certain time frame, and I'd like to meet with you. And so he literally did a kind of a cross-country kind of tour. And uh, he would meet with some of these uh, outstanding, well-known pastors and leaders. And he would uh, give them an envelope after he finished, and he had a set of questions ahead of time that he asked them. And uh, he would make a list of four to five crucial questions and a couple of other sidebars. And he would ask them those questions. And he just would, you know, how do you do this? How do you do that? Uh, how have you grown from such and such to such? Who, how do you choose leaders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So he asked them these questions. And then from early on, as a young pastor, he gleaned a lot of this leadership, of course, took notes. Um, and then he met with John Wooten, the well-known coach, I mean, the coach of coaches, for that matter. And then he talked to John Wooten, and, and he, learned, he learned this question. And he learned to ask this question early on. Tell me at least two people that you know that I need to know. Give me the names of two people that you know that I need to know, that you could put me in touch with, that my life would be better, I would be wiser if I met and talked with them. And, of course, that's how he got an entree to some of the great leaders uh, there in the California western part of the United States when he was at Skyline in, in San Diego, California. And eventually he was able to meet with Peter Drucker, one of the great uh, leaders in business management at the time. Back in the 80s, it was all about business management. In the mid to late 90s, it became more and more about leadership in the early 2000s. Now, since 2010, the buzzword is partnership. How do you partner with other persons? But Drucker was the business management guru. And Drucker used to ask two questions when he would talk to someone about their company or their nonprofit or situation. He would ask the, this question. First thing is this, what's your business? What do you do? You manufacture something? You provide a service? Uh, are you in the service industry? If you're a local church, what's your primary business? What do you see that as your primary business? What's your business? Do you know it definitively? Do all the people that work with you or for you know what you do? Or is there some kind of ambiguous thing that you're still trying to find your way and your people are kind of lost in wonder <laughs> instead of knowing exactly what they're supposed to be about? What's your business? And then the second question, how's business? How is business? How do you measure it? How do you effectively measure what you're doing? And are you achieving what you need to achieve? So what's your business and how is business? And all of that came from a desire to make right choices early on. You say, well, you know, Pastor Charles, I'm, I'm in my 60s, 70s, early 80s now. There is no time like today to start making wise choices. There's no time like today to start hanging out with people who have wisdom. There's no time like today to hang around people in your field who you view as successful, fruitful, whatever the case may be, and uh, ask them some questions. Tell me your story. How'd you get here? 
What are two or three top things that you think you've learned in your life that have helped you to be a better leader? And then if you want to dive in a little deeper, um, what are the top two or three things that you can tell me about how you have been able to or you try to um, uh, work out this, this challenging reality of balancing life with family life, marriage, and then work and things that you actually enjoy? How do you do that? Make wise choices early on, and, uh, and then don't do life alone. When leaders say that when the higher you get in leadership, the more lonely you get, the higher you go up the ladder, the more lonely you get. The more lonely it is. It's lonely at the top. If that's the case, you haven't led well because you haven't taken anybody with you. So that's foolishness according to Ecclesiastes and Proverbs. So if you're getting more and more lonely, you're not doing the right thing. If you back up chapter 6, 7, 8, 9, Solomon says, listen, life is all meaningless. However, <laughs> since you got to live it, don't do it alone. Spend it with other people. Take people with you. Because eventually you're going to have to pass the baton on to somebody else. The second principle is choose leaders wisely. Choose we leaders wisely. A, I mean, he just outlines it here for us. Don't promote the fool. Don't promote the fool. Why would you do that? It's foolish for you to promote the fool. The question I always ask is, is, who are other people hanging around? Who are other people hanging around? Who are other people talking to? Who are other people that when they speak, everybody else listens? Or who's speaking all the time, just throwing out all kinds of things? I mean, they're nonstop. According to Ecclesiastes, that's the fool. Why would you want to put the fool in charge? Now, if you read Proverbs, and Henry Cloud does a great talk on this in the Global Leadership Summit several years ago, but if, and he gets it right from Proverbs. And if Proverbs is 31 chapters, of course, you can read a proverb a day and within a month you'd be pretty much through proverbs especially if there's 31 days in that particular month june you just have to go into july of course but uh, you can read a proverb of a day and uh, but in proverbs it says that the wise person hears the truth and they adjust their life to the truth they hear the truth they hear wisdom they hear from god they hear from the holy spirit then they adjust their life to the truth. The foolish person hears the truth, and they justify their mistakes. They justify why they haven't done this. They justify why they got so much on them. And, well, I know I need to do a little better. I know I need to do this. I know I need to do that. Okay, but this is the third time we've talked about this, and you still haven't adjusted yourself to the truth. Stop making excuses. Either decide to be wise or continue to live your life as a fool. Now, which one's it going to be? And then Cloud goes on to say, there's a third category, and you hope to heaven. You don't have anybody in your staff or close circle like this, but they do exist. Thank heavens, there are only two, no more than hopefully 4% of the general population. Those are destructive people. And those are people that have not only maybe come to take over your organization, but they've come to do away with you. And they don't mince words. And that's a Jezebel spirit warp factor 10. Now, this is a spiritual podcast, so when I refer to Jezebel, it's interesting that some people give great pushback when you just mentioned that a Jezebel spirit. They say, oh gosh, he's going charismatic on me or he's going whatever. But did you know the Bible mentions Jezebel multiple times? I'm not, I'm not making this up. This is in the New Testament. And so you, you've got Jezebel mentioned, of course, as a true person in the Old Testament. Ahab's her husband. He's the king. By the way, you never have Jezebel spirit without an Ahab spirit. And Ahab wants to whine, fuss, and complain about how terrible things are 
So eventually a Jezebel spirit will rise up and give Ahab whatever Ahab wants. And the irony is, Ahab is a, is a, is a king. So an Ahab spirit plays the victim. But he's not a victim, he's a king. He can just give an order and have people killed. But the one thing he couldn't get is he couldn't go against Jewish law. And he couldn't get the vineyard. He couldn't get the vineyard because normal kings, I say normal kings, I'm talking about in the culture of that day, other kings, if they wanted vineyard, they would, they would just take it. They didn't have to ask. They didn't have to get permission. They didn't even have to buy it. Now, he did offer to buy the vineyard, if you read the story in the Old Testament, but the owner didn't want to sell. It was family property. He wanted to pass it on to his children and perhaps his children's children, on and on. So he refused to sell to the king. And the king got hurt, got upset, wanted that vineyard. You know, people sometimes want something, and they'll do whatever it takes to get it. And he screamed out like he was a victim. Be very careful and weary of people in your circle who are volunteers or who are leaders or who are on staff, and they want a position they want a position or they want a possession. And they will scream and fuss and complain until they can get a Jezebel to rise up and get them whatever they want. And she said, oh, king, that mean old owner of the vineyard, I'll take care of that. She sure did. She got the seal out. She even used his own name. She, she uh, used the king's seal ordered that the owner of the vineyard be killed, but she didn't stop there because if he had been killed and he alone, then guess what? His sons then would have inherited the vineyard. So she had to go down the second tier and have them killed too. Okay. And so she had the father killed and the sons. So then the king could come and get the vineyard that he really wanted. Now, the other spirit you really have to be cautious of because he comes across as your friend or she, because they can be male or female, come across as your friend and good intentions for the whole, but deep down, they want your throne. And that's an Absalom spirit. And they want to kill the king. That's exactly what Absalom wanted to do. So Henry Cloud goes on to say the destructive person is someone that you just have to immediately say, you know, God loves you and I care about you, but you haven't adjusted anything to, to try to meet what we've asked you to do. And the other thing is you just keep stirring up all kinds of stuff. You stir up chaos. You are just... You know, and, and it's just not healthy. And it might just be God has called you to another line of work, or maybe God's called you to another position someplace else. There are tough and difficult moments where you have to look someone in the eye and say, I think it's time that we part ways. And you're doing it for the betterment of the area that you're leading or the area. Now, it's also wise to get counsel. It's also wise to spend a lot of time on your knees in prayer. You don't make a rash decision. For heaven's sake, don't make one in a fit of anger or frustration yourself. And if you do say these words, it should be something that's got your own stomach up in knots because if you enjoy doing something like that, you need to be admitted someplace. Uh, and you need some deep therapy for the, about, about the next year of counseling. Because any time I've ever had to do anything like that, and thanks be to God, it's only been a small uh, handful, uh, it knots me up. I, I, I'm just um, I'm drained emotionally. Uh, it's tough. I don't want to do it, but I know I have to do it. And you always have to ask this question, what would great leaders do? And great leaders would not sidestep that responsibility. And the great leaders wouldn't hand it off or pawn it off to somebody else if it's someone or something within my immediate area or whatever. So, um, but most of the time, 
I have been the fool. But when I've heard the truth or the truth has been made known and I've adjusted my life and aligned myself with the truth and I've moved from the foolish category to the wise category. And when you do that, then you're among the wise. You're not a fool anymore. And there'll be people who you will work with and and you'll raise up and you'll invest in and they've done some foolish things. But if they're pliable and they're willing to make the adjustment and once they hear the truth and they're willing to make a wise choice and lead in a wise way, then, then okay, then they're in the wisdom category. We can all drift back and forth. I know I have (laughs) throughout my life and uh, probably in the last year I have been a fool uh, on a handful of occasions. But when you hear the truth, your heart and your spirit needs to be open enough to making that adjustment. So choose leaders wisely. Don't promote the fools and don't hold back the faithful who are willing to grow, who are the people that are hanging around wanting to learn more. There are the people hanging around. What else can I do to help serve? There are the people hanging around saying, You know, I'm just so thankful to be here. Is there anything else you need? Is there anything else I can do before I leave? Don't overlook those persons because those could be incredibly loyal individuals. Now, as I've shared maybe before in this podcast, John Maxwell in his Developing the Leaders Around You talks about that scale of 1 to 10. Um, And some people uh, are a 2 or a 3. They may be incredibly devoted good people, love God, but maybe their leadership capacity is a two or a three, then uh, you get them involved wherever you can to maximize their potential. But for heaven's sakes, don't put them as a leader of leaders if they're a two or three in leadership. Make sure you got a six, seven, or an eight up there because a seven or an eight will attract four, five, sixes, and sevens. But if you only have somebody whose leadership capacity is two or three, they'll only attract people who are ones or twos, or maybe three at best. So we need to be wise in how we're choosing leaders. Sometimes our temptation is just to fill a hole or fill a slot, and we'll fill it with a two or three because they may be very faithful, very obedient, and they may love God. But again, their leadership capacity is, uh, is just, I mean, they're the kind of person, they'll show up and do whatever. But really, they don't want to lead a bunch of other people. And so we've got to discern that. And we don't want to put too much on them. I have, as a leader, put too much on some persons who leadership, their leadership acumen is about a three or a four. And I put them in a seven or an eight leadership position. And they didn't stay there but about six or nine months because they got frustrated and and they bowed out. And rightfully so. I gave them an area of responsibility above their leadership acumen. And they, they just said, I can't do this. I can't handle this. Well, that wasn't that person's fault. Guess whose fault it was? It was mine. It was mine for not discerning more. It was mine for not praying through that more and seeking more guidance. And, uh, and then I did get along beside, um, I'm thinking of two persons right now, and say, listen, I still want you in the game. Please know we need you in the game. I think maybe I was the one responsible for that. Please don't blame yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Uh, this is an area that uh, that uh, is difficult, and uh, I just want you to know that uh, we still need you, and and you're still incredibly valuable here. So you may have to go back and you know and and reaffirm that person. The third principle is sharpen your axe regularly. Sharpen your axe regularly. I grew up in the country. There were times I went out to cut wood, and the axe was dull. That was a long Saturday. <laughs> and I shortened the Saturday when I went back into the, the building that Daddy had uh, his, uh, um, his sharpener, and I turned it on and took the axe and turned it upside down and then sharpened one side, then I sharpened the other side, then I went out. Lo and behold, sure did cut a whole lot faster. How are you sharpening your axe now when it comes to learning and personal growth and maturity? I'm going to ask you point blank. Tell me the names of at least two, if not three, books you've read in the last six to eight weeks. If you're not reading, you're dead in the water. 
What books have you read in the top, I mean, just two, if not three, in the top six or eight weeks? You need to be reading. You need to sharpen your axe. How are you going to stay abreast in your field? If you do a PhD today and you haven't read or written in your field in the last four years, you have all of a sudden become uh, a person of little value or use in your field. Scholars will tell you that. You've got to keep writing. Information's changing. Technology's changing. Thought processes. Have you read a book in your field? Have you written anything in your field? Have you read uh, articles that have been written? So just in the last few weeks, uh, I've read a powerful book, The Road We Must Travel. Francis Chan, Eugene Peterson, and others contributed to that. And then, of course, sermons by Wallace Chapel. Uh, sermons that really, it was a book I've had on my desk for years, and I've never read it. I've heard some of Wallace's sermons, of course, over the years, but it was great to, to read it. And then I've picked up the Outreach Magazine's recent edition, and I'm plundering through it, trying to find articles that might benefit me as a leader. What, what, what are you doing to sharpen your axe? you got to sharpen your axe. you got to stay sharp. How are you going to lead others if you're not adding value to yourself? You can't add value to others if you're not adding value to yourself. Ecclesiastes says you got to keep the axe sharp. Number four. Number four is to focus more, focus more on living as a citizen of the kingdom than on the institution or the family. Focus more on living as a citizen of the kingdom than you do the institution or the family. Now, I'm using family like institution. I'm not talking about don't invest in your marriage. I'm not saying don't invest in your kids. But I'm talking about in the work environment, in the workplace, people often use this expression, we're a family around here. Okay, good. Good. What do you do for the people that aren't part of the family? How do you treat them? You see, when you're a citizen of the kingdom of God, you can't have a kingdom without a king. So is King Jesus your king? Is your allegiance ultimately to him? Or is it to the family? Or is it to the institution? Are you living to please God and to please the king, or are you living to please your constituents? Most pastors, most spiritual leaders sell out to the constituents. They sell out to the family. They sell out to the deacons. They sell out to the elders. They sell out to their main players. There is nothing more frustrating to these spirits I mentioned to you earlier, Jezebel, Ahab, Absalom, there's nothing more frustrating in the entire world than a daughter or a son of the Most High God who knows who he is and she is, and they fully live as a citizen of the kingdom of God. They're sold out to King Jesus. You can't buy them, you can't intimidate them, and you sure can't manipulate them. Now, that doesn't mean they don't care for the people that they lead or the people they invest in. Of course they do, because they're a citizen of, of who? Of the king. They're a citizen of the kingdom. But their ultimate allegiance is to the king. Jesus came preaching the kingdom of the living God. Over and over again in the New Testament, he's preaching the kingdom of God. We have to point people to the kingdom. Here's some reasons why. you got to focus more on honoring the king as a citizen of the kingdom than honoring the family leaders and the family constituents. For the family mindset produces scarcity and survival, while the kingdom mindset produces abundance and taking new ground. Family focuses on keeping. Keep everybody happy. Keep everybody happy. Family focuses on keeping. The institution focuses on keeping. What do you think the United Methodist Church is doing right now? It is focusing big time on keeping. 
And it even tells lies like you can be part of a big tent. But if you're traditional and evangelical, and you're like John Wesley, and you believe in homo unius libri, let me be the man of one book. Oh, give me that book at any price. Herein lies enough for salvation for me. If you definitively believe in the authority of Scripture and definitively believe in the truths of Scripture, then you can't be part of the big tent. Oh, no, we want you to be part of the tent, but we'll give you no leadership. We'll give you no positions of authority. We won't put you in charge of anything. Folks, that's taxation without representation. We had a Boston Tea Party because of that in 1773 in this country. Even pagan people knew something was wrong with that. They weren't even church leaders. They wanted to throw all the tea in the harbor. Kingdom people focus more on reaching than they do on keeping. Kingdom people focus more on reaching than they do on keeping. Now, that doesn't mean they don't care about those that are there. Of course they do. But if you don't focus more on reaching, guess what? You'll never reach. The enemy will load you down, will load you down with guilt and shame because you hadn't been to see me in a while, Pastor. You hadn't been by to visit me. I walked in to see Mutt, who she was named Mutt Barley. It was a good name, good nickname. Uh, and she was sitting in a nursing home. She said, Lord, I don't even know who you are. I hadn't seen you in so long. Remind me and tell me what your name is. I said, Mutt, I saw you two weeks ago. Well, you ain't been to see me. So I said, Mutt, let me come over here and sit down and tell you where I've been. Let me ask you a question. How long have you been a member of Centenary Methodist? Well, I've been a member all my life. I said, all right, what are you now, 73, 70? I'm 74, all right. In the 74 years you've been a member of Centenary, have you ever gone up and down Centenary Church Road and visited every house? She said, why, no. Have you ever gone up and down Hampton Road and visited every house within a mile in East Rest? She said, no. I said, that's what I've been doing. I've been knocking on doors and inviting people to church. I can't do that and come and see you every day. I said, we got people that come around and say, well, I know, but it ain't you. I said, I know, Mutt. Now, if you need me, you can call me and I'll be here. But I've been knocking on doors of people that are going to die and go to hell, Mutt, unless somebody invites them to church and invites them to know the Lord. I never apologize for that. Don't you either. Focus more on reaching than on keeping. You can actually do both. Because when you focus on reaching and you get people involved and people do accept Christ and they start growing on in the faith, what's the job description of the pastor or the spiritual leaders in the local church? It's in Ephesians chapter 4. What is their job description? It's to train and equip people in building up the body of Christ. So you train your lay people to visit. You train your lay people to do pastoral care. You train your lay people who have the gift of helps and the gift of intercessory prayer and the gift of compassion. And these are all spiritual gifts to utilize their gifts in caring and building up the body of Christ. But you have to focus on evangelism. If you as a leader do not burn red hot for evangelism, then your people at least will just be warm. But if you're lukewarm when it comes to evangelism, guess what? Your people will be cold. You got to burn red hot as a leader for sharing the faith and evangelism. If we don't focus more on reaching than keeping, we will be non-existent in the next 50 or 75 years. And many churches are being closed all around us all the time because they focus more on keeping than they did on reaching. And if you focus on the biblical values of leadership... You'll train and equip people to care for people. Make sure that that's done, but you'll also have to burn red hot for reaching those who have yet to belong. And then the family becomes institutional while the kingdom becomes more missional. And so the kingdom focuses more, as we've said, on reaching than keeping, and then the kingdom mindset fosters It fosters a sense of generosity, while the family or institutional fosters a sense of survival. We're surviving. We just, we got to take care of our own, so we can only do this amount. We can only do that amount. 
I've shared for years that one of the things that we're supposed to do whenever we have a leadership meeting or a board meeting or whatever is often the Robert's Rule of Orders is, is, is followed, and that's not, not necessarily a bad thing in and of itself, but, you know, you have an opening prayer, you read the minutes of the last meeting, and then you want to get the treasurer's report. And then everything else you decide from that point forward is based upon whether or not you have any money or not. So you mean to tell me that the agenda of the kingdom of the living God is based upon your bank account? Folks, I got news for you. Heaven is not in a recession and God's not broke. And citizens of the kingdom know that. But institutional family organizations, they don't know that. They live within the confines of that scarcity mindset. They live within the confines of that survival. And then that dictates their capacity for what they're going to do. But if you're a citizen of the kingdom, you have a greater mindset. When you're a citizen of the kingdom, you also see other people as sisters and brothers in Christ. You don't see yourself as competitive. You don't see yourself in competition with the church down the road. Road, You see yourself in partnership with other churches. And anything you can do to expand that partnership, to fan, fan the flame of helping another church or assist them in that. I love Steve Shrogan. Steve Shrogan has been a hero of mine for decades. One of the things that uh, the Vineyard Church did in Cincinnati, Ohio, was to go out and do missions and acts of kindness all over Cincinnati. And Cincinnati, Ohio, was against the law to knock on a door and invite somebody to church. You couldn't proselytize. So one of the things that led them to do um, is they went around and put quarters into parking lot meters, and they put a little note on the uh, car. Uh, By the way, you were in danger of getting a ticket, and we didn't want you to have to pay a ticket. So we paid an extra dollar, a dollar and a quarter, so you could continue to park where you were. Your neighbors at Vineyard Church, just something very simple. They would start doing all kinds of acts of kindness. Went around cleaning toilets all over the, the, the community. We pulled in. Julie and I was trying to find Vineyard Church when we were in the doctoral program at Asbury. Pulled into a, um, a car dealership. We were going to a Saturday night service. Pulled into a car dealership. And I said, I think I'm close to Vineyard Church. But, oh, yeah, yeah, it's just about three blocks around the corner. Uh, he said, yeah, we know that church well. I said, well, if you don't mind me asking, how do you know it well? They come in here and clean our toilets at least twice a month. I said, they clean your toilets in this dealer? Oh, yeah, they come in there and clean the toilets. We let them. They talk, and they give stuff away, and they give us bottle of water and stuff like that. And then they leave and said, yeah, they're, they're a pretty cool church. They cleaned toilets in a car dealership. And then they clean toilets and strip clubs and, 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 uh, and bars and all places around the city doing random acts of kindness. Steve Shrogren used to say that, um, that he would rather give away and give himself away in ministry teaching and training and equipping people. So one of the things that they started doing after doing this for about seven or eight years is once God began to bless the church and it got up to 2,000 and 3,000 in attendance, and they said, we we need to help other churches. So they started training once a month other churches how to do it. And so they would go out and they would partner and help other churches do random acts of kindness all over Cincinnati. So it became like a random acts of kindness for all of Cincinnati. And their church led the way in helping other churches in their locations or wherever they were. And now it's just grown into this huge thing with random acts of kindness, partnering with other churches. You can do that when you're a citizen of the kingdom. You don't have to feel threatened. You can be in partnership, and you can just see the incredible ripple effect of what God is doing. So be careful about being institutional, family institutional. Be very careful. Live as a citizen of the kingdom of God. Thank you for joining the podcast today. And may God bless you as you perhaps engage in a random act of kindness on this day. Keep keep sharpening your axe. Thanks for joining us.